This is actually a presentation that I did in Copenhagen at one of the festivals Scott mentioned um, uh, earlier. I did this last year. Um, and so basically, I just, I've just come today to tell you a bit about the Larks and tell, us, tell you kind of who we are and kind of what we're interested in, a, a bit about myself, I guess, really. So um, uh, there's, there's currently four of us in the Larks. It's not, uh, I actually sent the wrong slide through here. It's not V, uh, it's a, a girl called Jana who's working with us at the minute. Um, but uh, yeah, there's kind of four of us who kind of make up this collective um, currently. And when I'm not kind of with them, I'm actually at the University of Salford at the minute. And you have to put a, a shiny picture of Media City, I think, because otherwise I might get shot if I go back there and I don't kind of show it off, you know. Um, uh, and I'm actually doing a PhD um, at the university where I'm, I'm actually looking into, uh, through practice, a lot of the practice with the Larks, I'm kind of looking into how we might fuse games and live theatre together um, and kind of why we might want to do that. Um, so, I guess one of the, the sort of things just to kind of frame the, the type of work that we're interested in and kind of why we do it, um, and I just kind of, just kind of want to uh, throw this out there. Um, we're, we're kind of interested in what, what might happen if we could interrupt kind of people's uh, everyday lives and, and offer them a chance to kind of go down um, you know, the rabbit hole. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to sort of throw that out there just as a kind of way to, to frame a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about and kind of show you uh, today as well. I guess the first thing to say about the Larks um, is that many of us and many of the people that we work with, we come from a theatre background, um, particularly um, contemporary performance and contemporary theatre. Um, these are just some of the companies that I guess um, have kind of influenced us kind of over the years as, as we've kind of you know, done our degrees and masters and, and started developing our practice. And I think, what's, I think what's key about a lot of this type of work here is that um, and what we kind of share with a lot of these, these sort of practitioners and companies from over the years is it's really sort of questioning what theatre can be, where it can take place and how it can take place and not just kind of, um, you know, sort of accepting that we know what theatre is and, and it's this thing that kind of looks a bit like we have now where you're all sat there not doing anything and I'm stood here doing things. Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of a bit about who we are. Um, I guess my research um, is kind of really fueled by this, this kind of idea here from um, a French uh, philosopher called Jacques, uh, Jacques Rancière. Sorry about my French, French pronunciation there, it's not very good. This is my issue with theatre, I think that to be a spectator is to be separated from the, both the capacity to know and the power to act. And I think that's kind of where I've got to as a, as a practitioner in this field now. I'm kind of fed up of, um, of sort of sitting in the dark um, and not doing anything. Um, um, and kind of, you know, letting, have, letting all the actors have the fun. Um, and I think that's particularly pertinent um, for the new audiences that we're coming through um, who've grown up playing video games, like I have. So that's kind, of, that's kind of the fuel, I guess, really, as to, to why I'm doing my research and why I work with the Larks. You know, it's not surprising, I don't think, that many of us in the Larks have, have kind of, you know, we kind of got frustrated, I think, with, you know, the issues around theatre that I've just explained. And it's not surprising that many of us have sort of turned to video games, uh, particularly games like this. This was a really important game in our kind of early discussions years ago. I don't know, has anyone seen Shenmue from years ago, yeah? If you haven't played this game, it's kind of an open world sort of sandbox type of game, I think is the term uh, that we use. Um, and what we really like about these games, um, and what kind of draws us to these type of video games, is the, the freedom that you've got. The, I guess the key word is agency. Um, you know, you have to act in this world to know, don't you, to go back to that kind of Rancière idea. You, can, you, know, you actually have to do something here if you're going to find anything out. You're not just going to sit and watch it. Um, and so these, were, this, these sort of games are often in our thoughts and often in our kind of discussions, really, when we, when we make the sort of work that we, you know, that we make. So about 2006, 2005, 2006, we started to think, well, what would happen if we tried to create... Um, a live experience that might kind of feel and look a bit like the sort of experience we would get in a, in a kind of sandbox game or an open world kind of game. And because we were kind of based in Manchester, we, you know, we kind of thought, well, what about Manchester? You know, Manchester's got, um, it's, it's just an open world environment, isn't it? Um, you know, it's got pretty good graphics, you could say, um, at times. You know, could we actually blend live performance with kind of video game kind of um, 
I guess, design process um, and make something. So we sort of set about um, experimenting with that. And the get, I guess the first uh, example that I'm going to show you today is a piece of work that we made um, called No, no Formats. Um, and this really was the kind of first, our first exploration into this, these sort of questions. I'm going to talk you through a bit about uh, how this game looked and, and kind of what happened in it. One of the things I should say, one of the things that's notoriously difficult about this type of work is kind of documenting it and then explaining it. It really is one of those things that you kind of often have to actually do to get, a, get an angle on. Uh, but I'll do my best to kind of talk you through. So we set this game in the northern quarter. So it's kind of lots of old kind of mill type of buildings that are now kind of being reused as kind of fancy, you know, kind of cool bars and lots of creative industries kind of setting up offices there. And it's just generally a kind of interesting part of town and we, we thought we'd, we would make use of it. So our first experiment was going to be a pretty linear kind of narrative. Um, and it would see the players um, basically meeting a series of characters who would be dotted around um, this particular area of Manchester. These characters had all had something stolen by the devil. Um, uh, we sort of we were in a dark phase, I guess, back then, you know, 2006. Um, and the idea was that uh, basically each of these characters would need something from you um, in order to let you kind of progress to the next one uh, until you kind of had a, a showdown with the devil at the end. Um, that's just a rough idea of... Uh, you know, where the characters were kind of uh, dotted around. And, and you'd get this map, basically, at the beginning of the game. One of the things that we, we thought was quite interesting at that time, um, well, there's a couple of things that we wanted to kind of explore. Um, often in a video game, I guess back then as well particularly, if you try to meet a character who you're not supposed to meet at that, you know, that particular moment, you kind of get this loop thing going on, don't you, where the character might just kind of go, say, go away, I don't want to speak to you now, and you'll just, they'll just keep looping that until you actually bring them the thing that will sort of trigger the next, uh, I guess, cutscene or, or the bit of the narrative. So we kind of wanted to sort of try and do that in this game as well, that, you know, if, if characters didn't have the, if, sorry, if players didn't have the thing that the characters needed, then the, you know, the actors playing these characters would just kind of go into a loop and just repeat the same thing and, uh, we tried to see what would happen with that. Um, but of course, the other big question for us with this is that un unlike kind of Shem Yu or any of these other kind of virtual worlds, um, this is the real world. Um, you've got the public going on here. You know, you've got people going about their everyday business. Um, and so this is kind of, this was going to be interesting just to see what sort of reactions we would get. Um, obviously, we've got lots of questions. You know, why are you dressed like that? What are you doing? Why is this happening? Um, so that's, again, this sort of pervasive nature of it. So I'll talk you through kind of what happened. So the entry point to the game, these are just some slides from some old video that we, we took of it. Um, the entry point to the game was me. I, I was the rabbit hole in many ways to this, uh, to this kind of world that we were creating. I was, I was stood in Piccadilly Gardens, which is just on the edge of the northern quarter. Um, and I was playing a, the role of a, of, a, of a pirate, basically, of a video game sort of pirate. Um, selling illegal copies of made-up video games. And, and basically, I would sort of offer these games out to people, and they all sounded ridiculous and pretty rubbish, um, and obviously they weren't interested. And I should just say, players were either invited to come and play, and they sort of booked a place to come and play, uh, but on the odd occasion, we actually, um, I actually sort of invited passers-by. You know, I tried to interrupt people's day and offer them a, a bit of a, a trip down a rabbit hole. Um, so obviously people go, no, I don't want any of those games. And I go, right, okay, well, it's okay, because we've got a new game. Um, it's on a new format, and it's called No Format. And then I'd reach into my pocket, I'd give them a, an envelope, and I'd give them a carrot. Um, and then I basically shout at them. I can't remember exactly what I shout. I think I shout at them, like, you've bought the ticket now, take the ride, no sympathy for the devil. And I just kind of ran off um, screaming, as you can see here, um, like a bad man. And I'm always interested in these people having the picnic here. I mean, what on earth are they thinking at this moment? So the players are kind of left there with this map, with this envelope with the map, some instructions, and a carrot. And they're just kind of like, OK, well, wow, OK, what do we do now? So they, they start to explore the map that I showed you earlier, the characters. And um, the first character that they need to find, of course, is the rabbit, um, who has lost its bounce. The devil has stole this rabbit's bounce. Um, but it's all right, though, of course, because You've got a carrot, haven't you? And we all know rabbits like carrots. So you, uh, you can give the carrot to the, the rabbit and then that kind of triggers the next kind of cut scene and you have a bit of a dialogue and the, uh, the rabbit gives you a set of batteries, um, which will be very useful for when you meet the, the femme fatale here, who is this kind of mysterious, kind of beautiful kind of 1920s figure just sat outside of one of the coffee shops uh, in the Northern Quarter. 
Um, and she's had her voice stolen by the devil. Um, and she's got this little tape recorder there. Um, and of course, you, it's no batteries in it, so it, her voice is on there and you can't hear it, but you've got batteries by now if you've seen The Rabbit, haven't you? So you can put the batteries in and you can hear what she has to say. Uh, and it was great, actually. She was sort of sat there, kind of people walking by, and she's just like pointing at the, uh, you know, the tape player, trying to get people to figure out that she needs some batteries. Um, she basically tells you that um, uh, she's had a voice stolen, she, you know, she wants to get the voice back. Um, she's been in a relationship with, uh, with another character in our world here who was the cowboy. Um, and the cowboy was uh, very sad and lonely, um, because I guess because he's, he split up with the, uh, the femme fatale there for some reason. Um, but the main reason actually was that he'd, he'd lost his mojo. And the femme fatale had actually given you, in return for um, taking the batteries, the femme fatale actually given you uh, a series of dance instructions. In fact, you had clear instructions of how to do a little line dance. And as we all know, there's nothing quite like a line dance to cheer up a cowboy who's feeling pretty miserable. So you do a little line dance with the cowboy and he's, he's kind of over the moon about that. Um, and then he, he kind of tells you uh, where to go next. Um, points you in the direction of a phone box. So you go to this phone box and the phone starts ringing and it's the devil. And the devil is on the end of the phone and he's like, I've seen what you've been doing. I've worked very hard to take those things from people and you've just gone and given them back to everyone. And I'm not very happy about it. I'm gonna challenge you to a final showdown in the, uh, in the Bay Horse pub, in the secret garden bit at the back. So you better come and find me. Now, unbeknownst to the players at this point, there's actually someone on the other side of the street taking a photograph of them, a Polaroid. So we've got an instant photograph. Um, and they don't know this at this point. That'll be important for a second. So, yeah, so the devil tells you to go to the, the bay horse, which is here. And uh, this is the kind of secret garden bit uh, at the back. And in there, you've got the devil, which is uh, this, this, this guy here. Um, and he reveals to you the final challenge, which is a game of Connect Four. Um, um, <laughs> and you've got a CD player there with some dramatic music playing. So we sort of sit some of the players down, put the music on, um, and then he reveals that they're actually going to be playing for their souls, because it is the devil, of course, yeah? And then he reveals the photograph that's just been taken of them. So the photograph's put down, it's like, right, we're going to play this game of Connect Four for your soul now. Um, and that's kind of how it ends, and of course you can win or you can lose, and if you win, you get to take your photograph with you, and if you don't, the devil picks it up, and it's with him now, and it's gone. Um, so that was our kind of first experiment in, in this kind of type of work um, all those years ago. Let's fast forward to 2011 and the apocalypse. Um, I don't know if anyone noticed in 2011, but the world was very, very close to coming to an end um, in Manchester particularly. Um, we saw an opportunity basically to kind of take what we'd done with no format and, and really kind of, you know, blow it up basically, make it kind of a bigger experience. Um, and uh, we kind of had this sort of theme of a, the apocalypse, you know. Um, it was kind of, I guess, current with some of the, the sort of political situations. I guess it's even more so in some ways now, isn't it? But um, uh, so, you know, we just saw, saw this as a theme. And obviously there's a, there's a long ongoing joke in Manchester. Um, this is one of the things in the Northern Quarter, isn't it? Um, on the sixth day, God created Manchester. So we often kind of thought, well, if it started there, then, you know, maybe it would finish there as well. So we thought it's a great setting to, to bring about the end of the world. Um, uh, and, you know, we had horses of the apocalypse and everything like that, but I'll, I'll come to them in a second. So, um, so at this time, we wanted to actually try a more non-linear approach. Um, we wanted to make a longer game. Um, we wanted to sort of use more, more resources. We wanted, to, wanted it to be actually be across the whole city this time, um, not just the northern quarter or one part. And we wanted more entry points into the game, more rabbit holes, if you like. Um, so there's essentially three storylines in this, in this adventure that we made. Um, uh, three storylines that basically, uh, there's three things you need to find to stop the end of the world. You need to uh, find a weapon, which is actually a song that you'll have to learn. Um, you need to uh, build yourself some armour and also make some uh, placards of things you want to save and protest for at the end of the world. Um, and then you also need to find out when and where uh, the end of the world is likely to take place. Um, and I don't have time to give you all the details of what, what was happening in that game. There was lots of things, but uh, here's just some images of the sorts of things that you might have encountered along the way. Scientists kind of, you know, doing scanning uh, and seeing that the fabric of reality was breaking up in Piccadilly Gardens. Um, and it did actually when the EDL showed up and the police got very nervous about us being dressed like this, which is kind of an, another interesting pervasive quality of this. Um, here's the people kind of making signs of things they want to save. I particularly love the Save My Teddy there, of all the things, uh, 
all the things that we could save at the end of the world. We had, uh, this was a kind of cool game, I don't know how the technology worked here, but it's kind of a cool game where you had to walk around the park and try and tune in to a message that was being broadcast, which would tell you the location of the end of the world. It's actually Castlefield, at the, the Roman kind of settle, settlement there. We made use as a, of some of the new flat buildings that are being made, a chips building which was being built there. Um, this is a character we had to, a puzzle to solve along the way. Um, and of course it culminated with the four horsemen of the apocalypse arriving, which you can see where the budget went on this. Um, and they kind of descend on Castlefield at, uh, later on in the evening and people all sing the song and scare them away. Um, now, so what was I doing in all this? Well, if you would have been in St Anne's Square on this day in 2011, you would probably have seen a fairly crazed looking man um, doing this, uh, walking around telling everyone the world was going to end. I was the, I was the doomsayer for the day. Um, and as you can imagine, I got um, some pretty interesting kind of responses from people. Um, some people genuinely kind of curious, some people actually quite angry with me, thought I was being sort of religious and some people actually kind of wanting to have a fight and so on and so forth. Um, I do have time to just quickly tell you an anecdote which I think kind of sums up um, what excites me about this work. Um, so I'm standing there and these two, these two students come out of a phone shop and um, uh, they, they're clearly just two guys, normal Saturday, we're just going to go into town, get some phones, maybe have a drink, normal Saturday. Little did they know they would bump into me standing there going, the world's going to end, we need somebody to save it, it's come and save the world. Um, and they come up to me, they go, what on earth are you going on about? And I said, look, the world is going to end today, I've been saying it for years, um, but, but you know, you can stop it, you can be the hero today, you can save Manchester. Um, and their kind of eyes lit up, they were like, and I sort of gave them the flyer which told them where to go and kind of start the game. And, uh, you know, their eyes lit up and they went, oh, wow, this sounds, we need to do this. We better save the world. They kind of completely wanted to play along. So they, um, they went off to the beginning of the, the game in the Northern Quarter. And sort of six hours later, um, you kind of see them amongst the 60, 70 other people in Castlefield. Uh, they've made placards. They've made uh, cardboard body armor to protect themselves from the horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, I saw them later. We had a big party uh, at the end of the world party um, in the soup kitchen in the Northern Quarter afterwards. And I saw them fairly drunk at the end of the day, kind of going, we saved the world, woo! Um, and I saw, I loved this idea that they didn't know, they just didn't expect that was gonna happen today. We, we, you know, we opened up a rabbit hole and then kind of, booted them down it really and, uh, and they had a great time. Uh, and the invitation is important, you know, I never forced them to do this, I just offered them a chance to be a hero for the day. We wanted to start to address things uh, a bit more, um, I guess in an overt way regarding the politics of, of things which we're all very kind of interested in and, and I guess that's why we've always been interested in theatre as well and political theatre. We wanted to tr basically try and make something more political and try and engage with sort of street games more, as well as kind of keeping the narrative and the drama of, of things. We wanted to kind of develop our skill as game designers, I guess, really. Um, so we made, we made this piece called Hacked Off. Um, now, this piece was a response to um, the newspaper journalist scandal in the UK, of course. Um, we all know about the, the, you know, the journalists hacking into people's phones and going to all sorts of lengths to actually get a story. And obviously there was the public inquiry as well, the Leveson inquiry. Um, so I've got a short video here, which um, I don't, I'd love to have time to kind of explain the game to you, but again, you really have to kind of play it. Um, but I've got a short video that just gives you a flavor of roughly kind of what was going on. Um, I was in the role of the editor of the Daily Hack and I'd set up my desk there on the street and we'd play this game in the streets. I was inviting people to interview for my newspaper and uh, in order to get a job with us, you would have to kind of prove that you kind of had no morals and that you were uh, a good hacker and that you could, um, you could you know, do what we needed to do to get a good story. Uh, so the game was played out um, uh, basically kind of using old retro Nokia mobile phones um, and we kind of tied these phones to street lamps, posts, you know, public furniture. Um, and the game kind of involved uh, players kind of taking on the role of a private investigator. They've got stories about their client that they're trying to protect, uh, but they're trying to hack the other stories out of the, uh, you know, the other cl uh, clients. Um, it's basically kind of running around, trying to ring the phones, trying to not get caught on the phones. Um, I'll show you a bit of the video so you can see. I'm the editor, uh, and I'm always on the lookout for, well, people like us, really. You know, people who don't have a lot of morals, you know, are willing to go out there, get their hands dirty, you know, to do a good job. Yeah? The idea is, is that the, the, the narrative of it is basically is that we represent a newspaper called The Daily Hack. 
Um, we're holding interviews today to find new hackers who can come and get us stories. Um, and the way that we're going to interview you is to put you through a role play experience where you're going to be a private eye. You've got uh, stories of a celebrity you represent you've got to try and protect. Um, but you've also got to try and get the stories off the other private eyes who are playing in the game. my favourite course in journalism school and it was lovely to have an opportunity to put it into practice. And I managed to not tell any of my stories, not that I have any stories. I think I feel cut out for this career, you know. I couldn't possibly comment. Okay. Fetishes to do with high heels and whipped cream. Should be known by everybody, I think it's to the advantage of the nation. I couldn't possibly comment. Okay. Well, you, you can understand why it's so uh, addictive to be that record. Okay, so um, basically that, that video there, that second video, what we did at the end, we invited people to give testimony to the Leveson inquiry and we gave them this little collar of innocence. People may notice Rebecca Brooks was wearing a, a white collar whenever she was seen in public after this. This was on the advice of a PR manager to make her look more innocent. Um, so we gave this to people and the quick point I want to make um, is what fascinates me is the way that people wanted to play along. They, they entered into the characters, you know? They're not actors, they're not performers, and yet they, they sort of immediately, without any kind of um, invitation, they kind of got into the spirit of it. And, uh, and they were making a political comment, actually, uh, by, you know, uh, after playing a game. Um, and this is kind of the territory that we're, we're interested in now. So, um, so I'm just going to finish with, sorry, I'm just going to finish with going back to this idea of the rabbit hole. And, uh, and another uh, quick quotation from Rancière. Um, just to throw out there. He says that the spectator must be released from passivity. He must be confronted with the spectacle of something strange, which stands as an enigma and demands that he investigate the reason for its strangeness. Um, and I hope that's what we're trying to sort of do here, I guess. So, um, so yeah, so thanks very much. Um, I guess the other quick thing to quickly say, just to tie it in, Roger asked me to make a comment about um, you know, how, this might, what this might, how this might impact kind of ICT and, um, and the creative industries. I guess what I'm researching really is, is how can a use of technology, whether that's actually the hardware, whether that's just the design principles used in making things like video games, how might that influence an art form like mine, which is obviously theatre, um, to kind of emancipate an audience? And what are the kind of political benefits of that, um, you know, in a democracy particularly? Um, so yes, yeah, so thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed uh, learning a bit about that. There are my contact details. Um, thank you.